Okay. So we're moving on to this monopoly homework and the cost curves homework has already been gone through. So, um, uh, so, so what is it about uh, competition and monopoly that, that we wanna focus on? Um, so I'll stop sharing and then we'll go back to the whiteboard. Okay, so, um, and let's see. Okay, Sonica, are you still there? Yeah, I'm still here. Yeah, just do me a favor and I'm gonna have the chat up over in the side. And if something weird mm. goes on or whatever, chat me and let me know like you guys lost contact or something. <laughs> okay, sounds good. Okay. Um, so um, let's talk a little bit about competition. Um, you all probably remember, but if you don't, that's okay. Um, you know, we're reviewing it. But we have to distinguish between the um, competitive firm and the competitive industry. And the, the main point is the competitive industry is composed of competitive firms, okay. And okay. And if anything I'm saying here sounds unfamiliar, then stop me and ask a question. But one of the things is, um, you know, we're transitioning here and I'm not suggesting that everybody is gonna understand um, the, the structure of this course. I mean, hopefully you do because it's, it's, it's good because then you understand how the pieces fit together. But at first we studied supply and demand and then we moved to this consumer choice problem. And that's really explaining um, where does demand come from for an individual? And then we know that the market demand curve is composed of the demand curves of all the individuals in the market. So we've answered the question, where does demand come from? But we haven't really answered the question, where does supply come from? And so consumers have um, utility as their objective and ultimately utility and their affordable set determine what goods they purchase and what quantity and how they respond to changes in price for those goods. For a firm, remember that the, the, the firm's objective, and if you guys ever get confused about the, the word firm, I think like the first time that I ever heard about it, and I'll chat with you for a minute, Sonica, or because or, you're in business too. So when, when yeah. you hear firm, are you like, oh yeah, okay, firm, or or does that like ever give you pause? No, I because like firm is interchangeable with like industry and company and and like all yeah. business majors. So whenever I hear firm, like unless it's like used in an, a proper sentence, like oh I don't know. Like, oh, this is firm, yeah. Yeah, like no. this mattress is firm or something like that. Then I'm like, oh, now I know what that means. But yeah. if someone's like competitive firm or this firm, then I'm like, oh yeah, they're talking about a company or something. Yeah, they're talking about a, you know a business, and that's that's right. So you could say it like business firm. That's what's left out, because first time I heard firm, I thought law firm, which mm. is a type of business. Yeah. But but you know, um, we're talking about business firms, and and an individual company, an individual business is one firm. So just. Yeah to get that out of the way and make sure that nobody's confused about that language. But firms have this objective, which is to, to maximize um, their profits. Mm -hmm. Now, in order to analyze that, we have to be more careful and say, okay, profits are revenue 
minus, and I'll just say this once, you know, it's, it's total. And what makes this a little bit different from what you might see other places is we're going to say it's the total opportunity cost. But what you'll see, right, is again, within our discipline, we know that costs are opportunity costs. So you just see that that profit um, is equal to revenue minus cost. And this is where we, we talk a little bit about the strategic management issue. Because, um, well, there are two pieces to profit, right? There's the revenue piece. And revenue is just the money the firm gets for its product or service. And I could say, to be a little bit more explicit, um, that it's it's the money the firm gets from right from customers for its product or service we just say product and we're not careful about distinguishing between products and services because that's not um, important for us and the other thing that we should realize right away is that if you hold revenue constant and and you want to increase your profit it's clear that you can increase your profit by reducing your costs okay so so um profit maximization implies cost minimization. And there's actually a whole lot to, to, to say about cost minimization, but we're not gonna focus on it um, for right now. We're gonna kind of stick to um, profit maximization, but it's important to realize that, that profit maximization implies cost minimization um, there's a bunch in your book about it, and it's something that we'll spend a little bit more time talking about um, if if um, we get a little bit more space in lecture. I probably will um, assign some recorded lectures that that talk about um, where um, cost minimization fits into to this whole picture but the the main point is that the firm has two um, targets for um, maximizing its profits and so it can either um, focus on trying to increase its revenues or and perhaps simultaneously figure out ways of reducing its costs in order to uh, maximize its profits and so a lot of, a lot of times you'll um, here in strategic management circles, <clears throat> um, that that you know they're focusing on a, a cost reduction strategy, or they're focusing more on um, revenue via marketing, you know, increasing sales type thing. Um, but it all boils down to um, this basic profit maximization. So, so. Um, Apart from <clears throat> explaining the, that cost um, minimization is implied by profit maximization, I also want you to realize that it's not the case that um, cost minimization implies profit maximization, right? There's a really easy counterexample, which is you could be producing your product at the least possible cost and then just giving it away. And obviously then you're not maximizing your profits. You're not bringing in any revenue. So, so 
you know, focusing on costs alone isn't usually enough um, for a business to be pursuing a profit maximization strategy. They also have to be doing something with the revenue piece. But if you say they're maximizing profits, you know right away that the costs are as low as possible. Okay, so I'll just say that, but cost min does not imply profit Okay, so now we get into um, this issue that ties up the, the last part of the class or almost everything that we're going to talk about. And um, so when we're talking about profit maximization, obviously um, the firm is going to do everything that it does with the idea of maximizing its profits. So in particular, um, profit maximization is going to determine the firm's level of output. Or in other words, um, the firm's supply decisions. Okay. And okay. So does this make sense so far, Sonica? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So so my question um, for you is um, so so I said that profit maximization is going to determine the the firm's so supply decisions, but um, does it make sense then that when we ask the question like how much is the firm going to produce what quantity the firm is going to produce that that's driven by profit maximization uh yes yeah i hope so um and and honestly i don't i don't know if you're familiar with this sort of metaphor um but you know back when there were um call it you know ancient times pirates and stuff like that a long time ago when they're trying to find their directions they always look for their the stars right and yeah and and they used to always um pay attention to the north star because it was easiest to see and it's like in the north so it can find their direction mm -hmm. Pro profit maximization is our north star in economics when it comes to figuring out what a firm is going to do the right yeah. answer it, for every question is oh okay is this going to get the firm if the firm does this is it going to get it more profit or if it does that is it going to get it more profit whatever it has to do with advertising you know doing cost management mergers acquisitions you know think yeah. very broadly about all the things that firms do and and the prediction of economic theory is well whatever it is the firm's doing whether they're donating to charity right it's all mm -hmm. with the goal of increasing their profitability yeah so so a lot of times firm students forget because when we get down into actually like solving problems we're going to come up with some you know very specific predictions about how the firm is going to choose their output and then you just see me say things like well you know the firm's going to choose it, this output because it maximizes its profit and then in other contexts mm -hmm. you'll see questions like well how much is the firm is going to is the firm going to produce and then yeah. 
students kind of forget, you know, it's like they're, it, it, it's like somebody off the street, you know, you ask them, well, how much output is the firm going to produce? And they I act like, students act like I'm asking them to guess. Oh, could be a hundred units. Maybe it's 200. It's like, no, <laughs> it, yeah. it, they're going to produce the quantity that maximizes their profit. And then we have mm -hmm. to go into our analysis and try to figure out, okay, is there a quantity that makes revenues a lot bigger than the cost? And, mm -hmm. and so um, in order to do that, um, we have to um, go ahead and be more specific about revenue and cost. And I will say one thing at the outset, and a lot this is a lot of students don't pick up on this, and that's why I pointed out it it's it's not necessary for you to pick up on it, but if you actually get into doing this in the real world, if you do get into strategic management or something, you'll realize mm -hmm. that all of our examples in um, basic economics, and you know, if you were to do it, extensions, um, they, there are models that, that extend to, to different cases, but we always talk about single product firms. And if you think about it, there's how many firms do you know that actually produce one and only one product? Uh, not many, especially now with Amazon and all these different uh, companies, they want to produce everything. <laughs> well, yeah, and if you think about it, I mean, in truth, it, you know, if you think about a pharmaceutical manufacturer, normally they don't like the people that are producing the COVID vaccine. I don't know if you heard about it, but Pfizer had this really good trial and there's like, you know, 90% effectiveness with their, their, the vaccine that they're um, planning to distribute in a few weeks. But Pfizer doesn't produce only coronavirus vaccine. <laughs> you know, they produce lots of different, um, you know, medicines and, and pharmaceutical products. And, you know, you think about, you know, Procter and Gamble and they produce everything from cornflakes to, you know, hand soap. Yeah. So um, it's very rare that you're going to run across a true single product firm. You might um, see that there's a company like that produces timber, right? Mm -hmm. So they cut down trees and they process the wood um, but then, even then, they normally don't produce a single product, right? Because they'll produce yeah. wood of different qualities, depending upon the tree and different lengths, you know, two by fours versus sheets of plywood. And so, oh my gosh, you know, it's, it's, it's really, really hard to find um, a company that produces one and only one product. Yeah. So this is an analytical simplification it makes our math a lot easier but what i want you to know is that the models that extend this to multi-product firms don't end up with um crazy different conclusions you know these models um it's just like do you, do you know like in in physics when they give you an estimate for the force of gravity they say it's 32 feet per second per second on earth have you ever heard of that uh, uh yeah right but you know they take that measurement in a vacuum and and you realize of course that we're not in a vacuum so there's yeah. there's resistance due to air and mm -hmm. so you might say ah oh, well gosh does that really affect gravity much well if you're talking about something like a rock falling, there's not a lot of wind resistance, right? But if it's a feather, right, then there's a lot of wind resistance. Yeah. So the prediction is a lot different. So in, in, in our case, we do the same sort of thing. We're starting out with a simple model and it works for most cases and, you know, straightforward, um, extensions to multi-product firms aren't going to uh, cause a big difference. Um, but, you know, you, you have to be a little bit careful. You have to know what your models are saying because 
if you're dealing with a firm that's the equivalent of like a feather, right? There's something really interesting about the way that it produces products. And, and, and you know, these, these results may not extend um, a straightforward way. Okay. Yeah. So, so in the case of a single product firm, and I'm just going to use PFT for profit, profit is going to be revenue and revenue is going to be the price of the product the firm sells times the quantity they sell. That's how much money they're going to be bringing in. Yeah. And then I'm just going to write C of Q here for cost because you know our cost um, depends upon the cost function. And we were looking together earlier at, you know, you can have a quadratic cost function, you can have um, um, a cost function that is linear, you could have a cubic cost function. So, so the cost function itself could look, um, you know, whatever it is that the problem that we're trying to solve gives to us. But um, I want you to notice, and hopefully, um, for those of you that haven't had calculus, um, th this part could be a little bit mysterious, but nevertheless, um, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, show the, the demonstration in terms of calculus to get to the rule that determines output for the firm. And so if, if this is a, um, a regular sort of smooth function, and I'll, I'll draw a picture down here where um, we've got the quantity of output labeled on the horizontal axis as we normally would. And then we're measuring profit in terms of dollars on the vertical axis. Then most profit functions end up looking like this. like a mountain, okay? And obviously in our case, um, we're looking for what we are gonna call Q star, the, the profit maximizing quantity of output. And you can see pretty clearly that the profit maximizing quantity of output is gonna be at the peak of the mountain, okay? And there's a, so, so what we look for is we look for, um, and maybe I'll just put over here, maximum. Okay. So does that does that make sense, Sonica? Yeah. Okay. So 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 um, one of the ways of of describing this, and again, this is something that you guys uh, should have talked about in calculus, is that. Um, that um, what we call the derivative of, of the function at any point is the slope of a tangent line um, to the function at that point. So in our case, um, if we were um, gonna look at the derivative of this function at this point, then the derivative would, would be the, the slope of that line that just touches it, okay? And then notice, so for this type of curve, right, the slope is gonna be different 
at every point on the curve. But notice that at <clears throat> the maximum point, that the slope goes to zero. Okay. So in that case, a line with a slope of zero is a flat line. Does that make sense, Sonica? Yeah. Okay. So, <clears throat> um, okay. So how do we find the derivative? Well, we take D, the profit function, divided by DQ. And we know that when we take the derivative of the function generally on the left-hand side, we're gonna take the derivative of the components on the right-hand side. And the components on the right-hand side represent a sum. Mm -hmm. So the derivative of a sum is the sum of the derivatives so um, if I do D P times Q, that's the revenue part, D Q minus D C Q divided by D Q, mm -hmm. then it turns out that the derivative of a function, and if you guys remember, I explained this to you a, a little while ago when we were talking about the marginal utility, but um, the, the coefficient in front price in this context is not a function of Q the way that I've, I've written it. And that's actually kind of an issue we have to talk about. But here, assuming it's a constant, we're just gonna end up getting price for its derivative and minus the derivative of the cost function by definition is marginal cost. And we're looking for where that derivative, remember, is equal to zero, where the slope follows, falls to zero. So yeah. we end up with this rule that hopefully is pretty familiar which is price is equal to marginal cost. Okay. And, and so what you might remember for a competitive firm um, price is constant at the market price. And so, so the importance of that is that the analysis that we just did assuming price was not a function of quantity gives us this relationship that um, for a competitive firm, price equals marginal cost determines the profit maximizing level of output. And again, um, that's because the competitive firm is a price taker. They can't influence the price of their product. They just have to um, take it as a given from the overall market. Okay. Does that make sense? Um, I just had a quick question. Go ahead. So I'm looking at how you took the derivative. So I'm guessing the derivative, like, essentially, I'm just trying to figure out how you got from that derivative, I mean, from there all the way to P minus MC equals zero. 
So is the derivative of the whole right side equal to zero just because like there's no- Well, well okay. So let me do my little spotlight thing. You see this part of the function, yeah. right? That I'm taking the derivative of P times Q, right? Mm -hmm. That derivative is just P. Okay. And the derivative by definition of the cost function is marginal cost. Okay. So I'm just I'm just saying, okay, if we take the derivative of this whole thing, we take the derivative of these two pieces and their derivatives respectively are P and MC. So the zero and, is essentially the derivative of profit divided by Q, like the derivative of profit divided by derivative of Q. Well, I, 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 the zero is something I added in because I'm looking for the place where the derivative is equal to zero because I know that's gonna be associated with the Q where the tangent line gets flat. It's gonna be the peak of the function. So okay. so this, this zero wasn't given by anybody, right? It's not part of the function. It's a condition that I'm adding to solve for this particular Q, mm -hmm. right? If, if I wanted to, I could have looked for this point over here at some Q. I don't want to mess up the graph anymore, but yeah, let's just call it Q less than Q star. And here you can see the slope of the function is it's a positive number, right? It's greater yeah. than zero. If I wanted to find the Q associated with that point, and I knew what the slope of this line was, let's say it's a slope of two then I could have put, I'm looking for um, where price minus marginal cost is equal to two. Yeah. Do you, do you see what I mean? Yeah, I get what you're saying. So the zero I doesn't come from, it's not just purely, you know, uh, mechanical like the derivatives are. The yeah. derivatives all just are like, you know, it's formulas you get from a function to the function's derivative just applying the formulas of calculus. Yeah. Uh, um, but the zero part is, is you know, the economic analysis, you know, of yeah. like what, what um, condition am I looking for that's gonna help me identify profit maximization? Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. I was just trying to figure out where the P minus MC came if it was from the left side or the right side, but I got it now. Yeah, it comes from here, right? Mm -hmm. Or when I take the derivative of this right side. Actually, taking the derivative of the left side, it's you know, it's 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 more um, semantics than substance, right? I mean, mm -hmm. this the definition of this function is everything here on the right side. Yeah. So I'm just you know showing. Oh, okay. I'm taking the derivative of this on the left side. So there's really no content here. This is just purely symbolic for all the stuff on the right side that yeah. are going to be actual functions. Mm -hmm. But it's just what people normally do. Yeah, <laughs> I understand. Okay, so um, so we have this rule, um, but probably one of the things, and and I write things like this because again, this is applied mathematics, and what is uh, happens in applied mathematics is that and they do this in engineering and other applied math fields and you know statistics and probability theory is that there's a balance between doing everything exactly as a mathematician would which is you know expanding in all detail um all of the math that you're doing and um exposing only those details, which is what applied mathematicians do, needed to kind of capture the result that you're looking for. So there's a, a, a balance here in the way that we use math. And what we really wanna emphasize is this, this, you know, what seems to be a very common and important descriptive rule, which is, oh, there's something special about 
finding where price is equal to marginal cost. And, and the reason why I'm saying it that way is because what you ultimately want to, to realize is that, um, and I'll write this a, a little bit um, more explicitly, is that, that profits are generally a function of Q and revenue is generally a function of Q, the amount of output. And costs are also a function of Q, right? So if we're gonna solve this more generally, and I'm just gonna, again, play with the mass, I'm just gonna, just gonna write D PFT for the derivative, right? Is equal to D, the revenue component, which is a function of Q minus D, the cost comp component, which is also a function of Q, right? Um, <clears throat> and for, for those of you that, that haven't had calculus and this seems very like unfamiliar, what you would end up doing at this point, um, if I had a whiteboard um, and, and I was doing this in lecture, instead of using the little d for derivative, I would use a capital Greek letter delta for change. And derivative just means change. So the interpretation here is this is we're looking at the change in profit as we change the quantity of the good and so we're looking at the change in revenue and the change in cost now we have again special um terms for the changes in revenue and the changes in cost and this is really the the substance of you know the economic theory that you're responsible for. So if we say the change in profit and we're talking about the change in revenue, that's what we call marginal revenue by definition is a change in revenue as we change output. And that's gonna be a function of the amount of output. And the change in cost is the marginal cost, okay? And again, if we're looking for the place where profits are maximized on the function, we're gonna be setting that equal to zero. And what that means is that Q star, the maximum profitable quantity or the profit maximizing quantity occurs where marginal revenue again, is a function of Q is equal to marginal cost, which is also a function of Q. But what people normally write is that Q star um, happens where marginal revenue is equal to marginal cost. This is the, the piece that should sound familiar from principles of economics. So I'll ask, does anybody have any questions right now? Okay. And since you've been doing such a good job, Sonica, I'll, I'll talk to you a little bit more. So that, that rule where marginal revenue is equal to marginal cost, or um, actually I should change this um, to an equal sign. Does that sound familiar? Uh, kind of. Okay. Well, if it doesn't, it should. There, again, there are some like review lectures that I put out there, but, um, but yeah, the profit maximizing quantity occurs where marginal revenue is equal to marginal cost. Now, the, the thing is um, we have different industry structures. Yeah. And the ones that that um, should be familiar are um, competition and monopoly and oligopoly. 
and monopolistic competition. And what what is different for all these different industry structures is only one thing, and that um, these only differ in the, and I'll just put generally this idea is shape of the MR function. So the, the big takeaway is that one, we're talking about how firms make supply decisions. We know it doesn't matter what type of firm it is. The firms are always going to make supply decisions to maximize their profits. That's our first takeaway. Yeah. Our second one is that in order to maximize their profits, the firms are always going to, um, regardless of what type of firm it is, they're always going to choose the quantity of output, make their supply decision based on this rule, which is they're gonna set marginal revenue equal to marginal cost for the last unit they produce. And they're doing that because again, that's as we've shown in this demonstration, that's how they maximize their profits. So it boils down to something simpler. And, and then as we go through these different industry structures, what we're going to notice is that the marginal revenue is going to look different. They're all going to have, and if you think about it, it, it makes it makes a lot of sense, right? Mm -hmm. it, it, if if you, you talk about a business, let's say it's a restaurant of some type. Yeah. Right? It, the restaurant is producing their goods and services with, workers and you know the restaurant equipment that's determining their costs right mm -hmm. but yeah. what makes a, a restaurant that's in a big metropolitan area different meaning they have lots of competitors right there's a burger joint on every corner mm -hmm. from a restaurant that maybe is isolated and has its own independent like market, right? They're the only burger joint in town, right? Yeah. Well, what's different is their revenue opportunities, right? They're all going to be working with the same equipment. They're going to be managing their costs in the same way, but they have these different revenue opportunities depending upon the type of market they're in. Yeah. So, so, um, you know, if you keep that in mind, as we go forward in these different types of models, then you, you won't get as confused because you'll be like, oh, okay, I know the marginal cost is going to be, you know, similar, but the marginal revenue is going to look different. Yeah. And, and um, then you can just focus on, okay, I got to end up getting the marginal revenue right. And, and um, you'll have an easier time of it. So I want to say, um, before we move on past this particular whiteboard, um, that the big issue that we've already mentioned is that um, with competition, I don't know if it's going to let me, let me see. Okay. With competition, marginal revenue is equal to price. So we've already solved that one. And so that means for a competitive firm, price is equal to marginal cost um, when they're maximizing their profits. So, so now I'll go on and, and talk a little bit more um, about the case of competition. And again, this is basically review. I, I'm not assuming that you all remember this in any great detail, though um, I'm assuming because you've been exposed to it that um, coming back to it was, will be easier. 
<laughs> the first time. Um, but the way that we normally analyze the decisions of the competitive firm is, and this should be kind of a, a, a familiar graph. So the competitive industry, and at the industry level, um, we're going to have a a demand curve and we're going to have a supply curve and we're going to have an equilibrium level of output in the industry I'll call it Q star and then we're going to have an equilibrium price P star So is this is this all making sense, Sonica? Mm -hmm. Okay. And then, um, and I'll just point out, you know, it's right there, right? Yeah. And and but for the competitive firm, they're going to see this market price, and that's going to determine the demand for the competitive firm. Um, so for the, the competitive firm, the individual firm's demand curve looks like a horizontal line, which is at the industry competitive price. And again, what we're trying to get across here is that, you know, if, if I'm, you know, one seller of, um, you know, soda, right, in a big area where there are lots of, you know, places that are selling soda. Mm -hmm. If I try to charge a price that's like twice what everybody else is um, um, selling their soda for, I'll just lose all my customers. Yeah. And, and at the going price, if everybody's charging a dollar and I charge a dollar too, then I can sell you know, as much as I want to at that price, because yeah. I'm a small part of the market. So one of the things that's kind of in the background here that we don't talk about a lot explicitly is that, you know, most businesses have, at least in the short run, uh, uh, what we would call a, capac a capacity constraint. There's a capacity at which they could produce. So let's say, you know, at maximum capacity, you could produce a thousand sodas. And then you could sell all thousand as much as you could at the $1, you know, price if you wanted. Yeah. Um, now that doesn't mean, right, that um, for sure that would be in your best interest that you'd be maximizing your profits. But um, what we do then, and hopefully this looks familiar, generally your marginal cost curve will look something like this. Mm -hmm. um, and so if you look where at the quantity where marginal cost, and I'll put this is the MC for the firm. Um, and I'll make this a little Q star and then where marginal costs, you can see here, um, marginal cost is below the price of the product. And remember, the price of the product 
for the competitive firm is also equal to its marginal revenue. So every time this firm sells a soda, it collects whatever the price is, like a dollar, right? And for these units, you can see the cost is less than the marginal cost, the cost of each soda is less than the marginal revenue. So this distance here, and I'll do a double-headed arrow, that distance represents marginal profit. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so maybe it's, I'll do it like that. And then I'll say, this is um, the change in profit or marginal profit. Okay. Mm -hmm. So here you can see that marginal profit is positive and then um, marginal profit is positive for all of these units and then marginal profit drops to zero and then past Q star, the orange little Q star, marginal profits become negative. It becomes more costly to produce. And um, I'll just say this in passing, but this is because of the phenomenon of diminish, diminishing marginal product or what you might have heard called in some contexts as diminishing returns. It gets more and more expensive for the firm to produce as the firm starts to reach its capacity. And again, this should be sort of intuitive because if you think of a, of a business and the business is, is, um, has a fixed capacity, then they really want to produce a lot of output. Then you can imagine they hire lots of workers and they're running overtime shifts and they're pushing everything to the limits. Well, yeah, that's gonna drive their costs up. Mm -hmm. So eventually the costs exceed this market price they decide not to produce. Yeah. Uh, um, where price equals marginal cost, that is the last profitable unit for them to produce. Now, yeah. one of the things I have to say, again, in passing, and uh, sometimes students get confused, is, you know, would the firm actually produce Q star if their marginal profit for Q star was zero? And I'll ask you that question. So obviously, if there's positive profit, they would do it. Would they do it if profit was zero? Um, kind of a trick I question, mean, they, right? So you're saying that if profit were zero, would they still do this? Yeah. Well. Well. Okay. So. So. Okay. So let's just be clear about one thing. What I'm saying is, look at these units over here. Yeah. Right. Would the firm produce those? Well, sure. They got a positive profit, right? They're adding yeah. profit, right? But what about Q star? Mm -hmm. Well, their profit is zero for Q star. Yeah. And obviously above Q star here, these units, would they produce them? No, because profits are negative. Mm -hmm. What about at zero? What, I mean, sh maybe, maybe they should stop a little bit before they hit zero. Yeah. Right? What well, profit's still positive. But we say, no, they stop when profit is equal to zero. Yeah. And they would because like even so like when we think of profits, we mean like what do we get out of paying for everything, right? And the thing is, is that your marginal cost, if that starts to increase, then you're going to start going into negative debt, right? Like you're going to start, you're going to see a negative thing. Like you're not going to have a negative return. Money. Yeah. Yeah. A negative return. Like you're not going to have enough, pro you're not going to have any profits, first of all. And then also you're not going to have enough money to deal with those costs. So essentially I feel like even if they're reaching profit of zero, they're still gonna land they're still gonna do zero because one, they're selling the most that they can and also covering their costs. Yeah. So also I want to point out this is, you know, marginal profit we're talking about. So this is like the profit for the so they made profits on all these other units. Those yeah. profits aren't going away. 
Yeah. We're just saying as soon as they start with this last unit, uh, they're going to earn a, a, a profit of zero. They produce it, but then they stop. I think they still, and, yeah, I think if you're going to, if like with that question that you asked, and yeah, I think that they would still produce that last one, that last good. At zero, but, even yeah, though they're earning zero. zero on it. Yeah, yeah. Because even though, because I like I, from what I remember from other classes uh, for econ is that essentially they want to it, it, essentially they're going to keep producing until they reach zero or until they start getting into the negative zone. So they would stop at Q star like lowercase Q star because they're still they're still able to like make money off of it. It's just not a profit, but they wouldn't go past yeah. that because then it starts getting into dangerous territory of well, yeah, because then they're losing money on yeah. on these additional units. Because again, we're talking all about marginal profit. If we if if we stop at zero, and I'll just point one other thing out really quickly. Mm -hmm. If you wanted to 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 calculate how much profit they had accumulated to that point, it would be the area between these two curves. Oh, I kind of went over a little bit <laughs> in my drawing, but all of this is some amount of money yeah. and they they're still keeping that but you're right i mean if if we went over into this other territory then we would start to accumulate losses and the yeah, more yeah. we produced beyond that that would take away from the profit we had already earned yeah i guess like, another thing that we could say like that makes more sense i guess is that a firm's just going to keep producing as long as they can cover those costs, essentially. So even if they're not making anything at Q star, they're going to still say, well, why not? Because they can still cover the costs. Yeah. And you know what? So, so, so you kind of hit the point that I was getting at, and this is kind of subtle. And it's the reason why I, I wanted to spend time on it, even though it seems like a small point, right? Because, <laughs> you know, just to, just to be clear, um, the way that we've drawn things, right? I mean, would it really change our analysis that much if we said they stopped at Q star minus a tiny, tiny bit? Yeah. Because here, right, everything is continuous. So this is like gallons of gasoline and you don't have to sell in whole units. This could be, you know, 99.99, .99, right? And yeah. Q star is 100. So we're saying they, they would just stop at just right just right before that right exactly so our analysis wouldn't really change much so it might sound like uh you know like why are we spending time on this you know let's just call it q star and get over it but there is an important point and that is remember we say things like in the long run competitive firms earn a normal profit and a normal economic profit is zero right um, yeah. so, so when firms are earning zero profit, the important thing to realize is what you hit on at the end, which was they are covering all of their costs and that includes their total opportunity cost, which also includes a normal rate of return that you would yeah. get from an accounting type calculation. So even yeah. though this firm is earning zero profits, it's zero economic profit, which means on that last unit, they're earning from an accounting perspective. Remember, normal profit from an accounting perspective, meaning the average profit that firms tend to earn in the United States over time is about 7%. So, yeah. so they're still earning a 7% return from an accounting perspective here. The, the issue is that if they were to go beyond that, right then they're doing some activity where they're earning less maybe they're actually losing costs from an accounting perspective too uh, meaning they're not yeah. covering all of their costs of just operating but they're no longer earning a normal rate of return they're earning something less than they could earn if they just took that money they were spending and put it in the s p 500 or in the stock market yeah. so so the point here is at Q star, they're earning zero economic profit. They're covering all of their costs, including a normal rate of return. But to go beyond that, 
they would be better off doing something else with that money rather than spending it on producing this good if they're yeah. earning less than a normal profit. Mm -hmm. So yeah, the 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 firm will stop at where P is equal to MC, um, where profits are equal to zero. So so that's our com competitive firm analysis. The the there are a couple of other things that we want to um, cover, and I'll talk about them really quickly. Um, and so, um, if we were going to move to monopoly, um, the difference here is that remember that a monopoly firm is the entire market. So whereas for a competitive firm, we have this, you know, diagram that's connected to the industry via the market price, for the monopolist, the monopolist, there is no um, distinction, and I'm going to put a big red X here. And that means like a no, <laughs> and maybe I'll do it like this. There, there is no firm that's distinct from the industry. For monopoly, the monopolist is the only seller. So, um, this is monopoly. They are the entire market. They see the entire market demand curve and the supply curve. The one thing that we have yet to really discuss, it's in some of the materials I distributed for you is that the, this red line, which would be the supply curve for the competitive industry it ends up being the marginal cost curve um, from a monopolist perspective. And so for the monopolist, the, the key difference is that the monopolist doesn't have a market price that determines their marginal revenue. Instead, there's a separate line which is the monopolist marginal revenue. And so I'm going to label that as marginal revenue. And um, where marginal revenue equals marginal cost, again, determines the profit maximizing quantity. So I'm going to call this QM and QM is where marginal costs are equal to marginal revenue. Maybe I'll do a different color here. So that's the monopolist um, quantity, but you have to go up to the demand curve to find what's the maximum price that the monopolist can charge for that level of output. And so there's the monopolist price. Okay. So, so this is a, again, a brief review of competition and monopoly, um, you know, like the simple mechanics of it. There are a few more things again that we have to, to cover. And so I'll come back and I'll talk about this in more detail next Tuesday. And I'll distribute some other lectures. I, I understand that watching the video lectures might be a little bit tedious. I recommend watching them on like one and a half speed. So you save a little bit of time, but you probably wanna be ready to pause and take notes because all of that material um, is important and it'll support the stuff that we're doing right now. Okay, so that's a recommendation. Make sure you watch that stuff that I send out. 
Um, okay, any other questions before I let you all go? No? 